What's the most disturbing confession you've heard? Trigger warning. Story 1. Americans won't know this, but here in Brazil, there's a criminal called Fernandinho Beramar. This guy was the head of the Commando Vermelho, or Red Command, the narco rang that rules Rio de Janeiro. You can read up on him. He was a mastermind of crime, an extremely intelligent man, but also absolutely cruel and ruthless. In 1999, a 21-year-old student named Michelle Anderson had an affair with one of Beramar's girlfriends. Michelle had one date with the girl right after securing his first job as an assistant in IT. Beramar ordered his execution. Michelle was tortured for one hour. After that, Beramar called him. The call was taped as police were on to Beramar, but they never expected to hear this. If you're sensitive for this kind of thing, know this. Not safe for life. BM is Beramar, MA is Michelle, and T is the guy who was torturing Michelle. BM. Hello, what's up dude? T. Hey master, how are you? BM. All fine. T. He's already eaten his other year. BM. He ate both? T. Yeah, yeah. BM. Well, let me talk a bit with him. T. Okay. He gets a bit away from the phone and talks to Michelle. Talk to him, man. BM. Hey, man. How you doing? MA. Sobbing. I'm all cut. Both ears gone. Both feet gone. My fingers are hanging. My right ear is completely off. I can't hear. I just hear a noise. The left ear they took just a piece. Because if they took it off, I wouldn't hear you. His voice is cackling. BM. But you're still talking. MA. Because I'm hearing. But just a bit. BM. Hearing well? MA. No, please. Sobbing. Speak louder. BM. Keep talking. You're doing well. MA. They took it all off. Everything is hanging in front of me. I have only my heel. BM. Oh wow. What about your pretty fingers? MA. Pretty fingers all hanging. BM. Were the ears tasty? MA. The ears are too big. They entered my mouth. I almost swallowed it. BM. Oh really? All that for pussy, huh man? Damn, that fucking pussy, right? Expensive ass pussy, right bro? MA. If I knew, I wouldn't get involved. BM. Really? Damn. MA. I'm talking from my heart, sir. I can't walk. They try to make me walk, but I can't. I can do three steps, but my legs hurt so much. Everything hurts. Beramar then mocks the boy and gives him hope that he would get away from that torture session. The boy's will to live made him believe the false promise. BM. But okay, you're talking a lot. MA. It's because, hey, it feels like they made a truck run over me. They broke my ribs. BM. No, I won't let them do this to you. The ribs must stay together. Now, when you go home, because I will call a cab to take you home, I'll call a taxi and it'll take you to... Well, where do you want? Dookie. Then the same taxi will go to your family's home. Okay? You're quite the stallion, huh? M.A. No, no, sir. B.M. What a nice pussy, huh? That damn pussy, huh? M.A. Talk louder. I can't hear you because of the blood running down. B.M. Come here. What a damn pussy, huh? M.A. Yeah. Beromar then asks to talk with his right-hand man called Bomba or Bomb. He certifies him that Michelle ain't doing well. Bomba. What's up, boss? B.M. Man, but he's reacting, huh? Talking aloud, right? Bomba. He is strong, right? BM. Acting all tough, right? Bomba. No, he's humble now. Pretty humble. He's over here, pretty shy, pretty fucking shy. BM. Now he's humble. Bomba. All humble, all shy. Not fucking around. BM. But beat him a little more. A nice little beating. Then I'll call again. Beat him just to finish it. Then I'll call back later, okay? It wasn't enough that the student was suffering from the torture. Beromar liked to mock his condition. Even by phone, he would make a fuss to prove he was in charge. Beromar told Bomba to pass the phone to Michelle again. He wanted that one of his friends, Jose Alton, J.A., who was by his side in a farm in Paraguay, could also talk and mock the boy. B.M. Talk to my friend here. Tell him how you're doing. My friend is a doctor and he'll give you a receipt. M.A. Please. Sobbing. Talk louder. J.A. Hey, comrade. M.A. I can't really hear you well. J.A. Oh, yeah? M.A. The blood doesn't let me hear you. J.A. Oh, I'll tell them to clear your ears. How are things going there? M.A. I don't have my ears. I only have my heels. It feels like a truck ran over me. J.A. Sometimes we go somewhere to fuck and end up getting fucked, right? But, alright. Jose passes the phone to Betamar so he can talk to Bomba. B.M. Does he still have fingers? Bomba. No, he doesn't have anything. He has nothing. Nothing. Even that thing that holds your feet forwards? He doesn't have that. It's flat, like a friend leg, because there's nothing left. 
BM. Okay, I beat him a little bit more than in 10 minutes. I'll call you again to see what we'll do. Go slowly. I don't want things rushed, okay? Then there's the second tape. T. Hey, boss. BM. Let me talk to my associate, Michelle. T. He doesn't have hands anymore, boss. BM. No hands and still talking? T. No hands, no ears, no feet. Talk to him. BM. Hey, what's up? M.A. I'm broken. BM. All broken? But you're the hot guy. What a damn pussy, huh? How many times did you fuck her till today? M.A. Just that one. I never saw her again. B.M. No, how many in total since it started? How many times did you go out with her? M.A. Just once. Then she... Inaudible. B.M. Wow, just once? Liar. You told before that you went out three times. Now you're saying it was only once. M.A. Three times that she went to my house. B.M. Oh, you're still acting. Fuck. Holy shit, dude. Are you hurting? M.A. I don't feel a thing. B.M. Nothing? M.A. No. B.M. No? Damn, well, I would have taken you to Duque now. I'll call a cab to Duque, alright? M.A. Okay. B.M. I'll tell the boys to call the taxi so you can go to Duque. Let me talk to Bomba. M.A. Gomba, you. B.M. You can do it now. Five shots are heard, alongside laughs. Bomba. Hey, B.M. Just make him vanish. Michelle's body was never found. Betamar got 30 years for this crime. This was the only crime he got caught for. The audio is available in Portuguese. Reminds me of the time I went out with a girl who apparently had a boyfriend. When he found out, all I got was a bunch of angry spam calls and spam messages from him, which kinda annoyed me pretty quickly. In hindsight, way better than what poor old Michelle here had to go through over just a couple of dates. Count your blessings, I guess? Story 2. There is a video of a man and his wife and child riding in a car on the highway. They're behind a truck carrying bricks, something falls off the truck and goes straight through the windshield on the passenger side. I haven't seen it in a long time, but you cannot see what's going on. I believe the brick rips the camera off, but there is a brief pause while the shock wears off and you just hear the worst scream from the husband and the child is crying. If I remember right, the brick actually fell from a truck in the oncoming lane, so there really was no way to avoid it. Once in my childhood, on a road trip with my family, we noticed that the car on the freeway ahead of us was hauling a table on a trailer. My dad was driving, I was sitting in the passenger seat on map duty, everyone else was in the back. We even talked about it. He said he didn't think you were allowed to drive that fast with that kind of trailer. Then, just minutes later, air got under the table, it lifted off the trailer like a paper airplane, and sailed, as it looked, almost straight for our windshield before sailing over the car. No one else in the car noticed but me and dad, they just asked why we swerved. Dad didn't say anything, he just turned off at the next rest stop and we got ice cream as he just sat there for like half an hour. I don't know where the table landed, I didn't have the presence of mind to check the rear view mirror, but I sat there next to him as the others stretched their legs and goofed around. Without being told, I knew I wasn't supposed to say anything about it, but I could sit there and we could not talk about it together. I hope it sails straight off the road. I would have heard something if it hit someone behind us, right? I still sometimes wonder what would have happened if we were just a car length further back. I still sometimes wonder if it was as close as it looked. We've talked about it since, but we never told anyone else who was in that car. It just doesn't feel like something we talk about. Story 3. The 911 call of Loretta Pickard, a disabled elderly woman who died in a house fire. She was physically unable to get out of the house on her own. There were firefighters outside of her house, but due to a miscommunication, they thought the house was empty. On the call, you hear the woman talking as the fire gets worse and she gets closer to death. Everyone jumps on the dispatcher whenever this story is brought up on Reddit, but even if she had taken that call flawlessly, Loretta would still have died in that fire. It was the fire department, not the dispatcher, that killed her. Yes, it took the dispatcher two minutes to figure out that Loretta was disabled and strapped in the fire. And yes, that is ridiculous. However, by the time she managed to put it all together, the FD was still a long way off from arriving at the scene. The FD had been told repeatedly before they arrived that there was someone trapped inside. They were then told repeatedly after they arrived that someone was trapped inside. However, they decided to treat it as a standard unoccupied structure fire. So the first team to arrive called for another truck because they were implementing the two-in, two-out rule, which is basically a buddy system from OSHA that requires a minimum of four people to attack a fire from inside of a building. However, they weren't attacking the fire. They were there to rescue someone. 
and the 2 and 2 out rule does not apply in that situation. Moreover, their own department policy covering the situation they found themselves in required them to make entry and attempt a rescue. The FD's battalion chief, who would arrive later but was in radio contact the entire time, also never corrected the 2 and 2 out call. What he did, though, was lie to the media about the FD attempting entry and having two firefighters being injured in the process. Two things that never happened, at least while Loretta was still alive. And it's worth noting that Loretta was on the phone with 911 for 20 minutes. The fire department was on scene for five of those minutes. She knew they were outside. She died knowing that they were doing nothing to help her. Story 4, accompanied by video, but a lot of the school children who drowned on the MV Sawol recorded short video clips as the ship was sinking. Hearing the crew telling the students over the loudspeaker to stay in place and stay on board is absolutely chilling. The children made snide remarks about how crazy it is to stay on board with the ship listing so far, but they remain in place. One of them literally jokes, this is the part where they tell us everything's fine and we should stay put while they run for their lives. So fucked up that that's exactly what was happening. I remember watching these when it happened. Some students were laughing and joking, others crying and trying to call their parents. Some sat silently either awaiting rescue or death. Seeing them struggling to sit as the ship is sinking, struggling to stay out of the rising water, and the point where they start realizing they're doomed wasn't the best idea for a 14-year-old me to watch. The loudspeaker was stuck on the announcement to stay in place. There were ways to still notify everyone. It was just a colossal failure of negligence by all involved. The captain changed clothes to not be recognized and did not tell rescuers about the kids trapped inside. The government wouldn't send help until they received video of the event, which got delayed and delayed. Basically, everything that could be ignored was ignored. Right down to ship maintenance and an inexperienced crew giving wrong coordinates. Steering into an unrecommended route and turning the ship irrevocably to one side, causing all the unlatched vehicles and cargo to pile onto that side. Can I just say that this has got to be probably one of the worst ways to possibly go out? I mean, it's one thing to get abandoned by authority figures meant to ensure your protection. It's another to come to the realization that you're going to die a slow, slow death by drowning in a sinking ship, knowing there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Rest in peace to those poor kids, man. Story 5. That 911 call from the guy trapped in one of the Twin Towers. I'll never forget that audio. The guy is saying in a panic, Lady, we're not ready to die, but it's getting bad. Then a short while later, you hear the floors above coming down. He screams, Oh God, no. Then silence. My only hope is for those that did perish that it was quick and they felt no pain. Absolutely horrific. I have a family member that was a firefighter for 911. He was in one of the trucks because he had to come from the other side of the city. I'll never forget what he told me. The armada I was part of was relatively late to the scene. When we got there, the first tower was gone, and the second was, even though we didn't know it at the time, was only a few minutes from coming down. We drove directly beside the second tower, and the road got really bumpy. My chief told us newer guys to not look out the windows. Exiting the truck at our designated parking spot, I realized it was body parts we'd been driving over. Apparently, people had given up and jumped from a height that made their body explode or tear apart on impact with the road. There was video from that day with firefighters inside the towers, and you can hear what sounded like explosions outside. The firefighter explained it wasn't debris falling or subsequent fires igniting. It was the sound of bodies hitting the ground with such force that they were exploding from the sudden impact. I listened to audio of people jumping from the towers in my 11th grade history class, and I don't think I'll ever forget that sound. Story 6 I can't remember which podcast, but I think it was a psychology or brain science one. There was this girl who was being recorded in surgery for deep brain stimulation to treat her depression. She had a completely debilitating depression in her life, just felt like utter garbage every moment of every day. Anyway, they needed to try and find the part of her brain they could stimulate to make her feel better. They'd stimulate one spot, ask for her reaction, and then stimulate a nearby spot. Anyway, they hit the right spot and suddenly she felt okay for the first time in her life. Then the surgeon changed something and you could hear in her voice like she was being sent back to hell. She said something like, no, not there, that's the wrong spot, that's horrible. And the surgeon said, I didn't move the probe to a new spot, I turned it off. She thought some new part of her brain was being stimulated and it was causing her to feel incredibly bad. 
but that wasn't what happened. The stimulator was stopped and she had returned to the same state she had been in her whole life after a moment of escape from it. This one is intriguing. Did the stimulation help her afterwards or did she go back to being depressed after the surgery? It worked. The follow-up interview was a few years later and she was living a normal life. There was a problem though. As her brain habituated to the electrical stimulation, the effects started to gradually fade a little bit. To compensate, the probe has the ability to raise its voltage, but there was a limit to how high it could go, and she was going to hit that limit in a few years. They didn't really have a solution, and she's trying to string out the increase in stimulation as long as she can, but eventually she'll hit a maximum and she'll start declining again. Story 7. I'd venture that the Toolbox Killer's audio recording of them torturing and raping Shirley Ledford is probably pretty high up on the list. It has never been released to the public or leaked, but there does exist the full transcript online. We played out the process back then, but it was so disturbing that people went sick and left the courtroom. NBC covered the process, watch it on YouTube. At one point when the court door opens and people come devastated outside, you can hear for a second an agonizing scream from the tape. The detective that arrested Bitteker and Norris died of suicide two years later. In his final words, he wrote, Hearing the tape started a trauma in him he couldn't get out of his head. Another guy that could listen to the tape was actor Scott Glenn. While filming Silence of the Lambs, he got the chance. He thought, okay, maybe it's good for my film character. He couldn't make it longer than a few minutes. It's sure a damn good thing that he wasn't one of those actors that decided to go all method actor to prepare for his role, huh? Story 8. The 911 call Jennifer Pan made after she hired people to try and kill her parents. At one point, her surviving father starts shouting and yelling in the background. This is after he had been shot multiple times. I think one of which may have been to his head or neck. When I tell you that I can still hear her father's screams, I mean it. It might not be the worst thing on here, but it's fucking harrowing. I unknowingly met her once years ago, while she was and still is in prison. I was part of a group that did a course with some of the inmates. She just went by Jenny, and although I knew about the case, I didn't put two and two together. I just thought, wow, she seems really nice. Wonder what she did to get in here. Our instructor told us not to research any of them until the course was complete. I looked them all up immediately after the course finished and almost threw up. I'm still shook. One time in the classroom, she came up and tickled my sides. It makes me sick just thinking about it. The worst part of people that do these things is that they're still human. Story 9. The 911 call of the lady stuck in her car in a flood and the operator is so unhelpful. She ends up drowning on the other end of the phone. If it's the same incident I'm thinking of, that happened near where I used to live. That 911 operator was not only unhelpful, she took her damn time sending anyone out to help the driver. And instead of being fired or charged with anything, she was allowed to retire and the county just kind of hand waved it away, saying there was nothing they could do because she'd already retired. This hits home, my nan had a medical alert necklace, she pressed it and laid there dying. Respiratory issues, unable to do anything else. The person working with the alert company called 999 and the two of them chatted away. They clearly worked together every night without a care in the world. Their communication was also awful. So the 999 operator heard multiple things wrong, and the alert operator didn't correct them. Neither checked the info at the end, so it was considered lower risk than it was. The ambulance took 4 hours. Instead of the about 10 minutes that it would have, she died. Maybe she'd have died anyway, but still. After the complaints procedure, the operator was brought in front of a panel of senior officers and her family, where they basically played the audio back for her, tore her a new one, and asked her to resign, which she did. Story 10. The 911 call from one of the teachers present at the Columbine school shooting. You can hear the gunshots and the gunmen cheering and whooping. You also hear when they enter the library, which is where they kill the most students. It's chilling. My high school girlfriend's sister was a student at Columbine at the time. She survived simply because another person died very close to her, and the gunman thought he got them both. Her stories were beyond description of sadness and agony. She's mostly okay today, from what I understand, but it took a long time to get there. I'm related by marriage to a survivor. She knew the shooters very well. She was in the library that day. She survived only because she had been nice to them. They told her so as they killed a girl next to her. Survivor's guilt is real and can be devastating. Story 11. The 911 call from the attack of Travis the Chimpanzee. 
Travis's screams can be heard in the background at the start of the tape as Harold, the owner of Travis, pleads for the police, who initially believed the call to be a hoax until she said he's eating her. Reminds me of a news story I read. A teen went camping with her father or stepfather and they were attacked by a bear and her cubs. The bear left and came back while the teen was on the phone with her mom. The teen at one point said, Mom, they're eating me. I cannot imagine how awful that must have been. Yeah, wasn't this in Russia? She made multiple calls and the last one was telling her mom she doesn't feel pain anymore. Story 12. Perhaps not the worst, but still haunting. The mayday call from MS Estonia and the following radio traffic at sea. After the first couple of conversations, Estonia is quiet. The first ship reaches the destination less than 20 minutes later, but the Estonia is just gone. There's also recreations of the Titanic's Morse code communications. The way it just switches from Phillips catching up with messages from passengers to Cape Race, the radio had been broken and he and his co-operator Harold Bride had fixed it. Against standing orders, if I remember correctly. At that point, they had already hit the iceberg and been told by Captain Smith that they should get ready to send out distress signals. But they were still trucking on. And then it just descends into madness. You can actually tell how it goes from standard operations protocol to actual panic. Also, one of the first times SOS was used. Wright apparently told Phillips to use it because it's a new one and it might be his last chance to send it. It was. Phillips died in the sinking. Bright survived and spent his time on Carpathia, helping Carpathia's radio operator in managing the flood of messages, even though his feet were badly damaged from the cold water. Loads of folks also gave Frankfurt grief when they were watching the transcript because she seems to be oblivious to the emergency. But Frankfurt was small and almost out of range. Her transmitter was also a lot better than her receiver. They could barely hear the Titanic. Never mind the other ships, they were over 100 miles away and, just like all the other ships, tried to get to her in time. Story 13. The Apollo 1 Crew Those guys were the coolest, calmest, most extensively well-trained former combat test fighter pilots in the world, and all they could do was scream. That audio kept me up the night I heard it the first time. I worked out the National Archives long ago and had access to the transcript, predictably mostly screaming. If I remember correctly, the document itself had an attachment saying the audio had been destroyed out of respect for the families. Though I had some doubts about that, only today, 20 odd years later, I learned that wasn't true. Story 14. I'm sure others have mentioned it, but one that really, truly upset me was when a poor delivery lady had mistakenly driven into floodwaters. She called 911 and the dispatcher was cruel beyond words. I'll never forget it. This one came to mind. Also, the 911 call of the little girl trying to get help for her mom who was stabbed, shot, and the dispatcher is like annoyed with the kid and keeps asking her to put her mother on the phone. The poor social worker who called 911 when Josh Powell, who it is believed was involved in his wife Susan's disappearance, locked himself and his two kids in the house and locked her out is maddening. The 911 operator keeps saying who, what, while the social worker is pleading with the police, trying to explain that this madman has the two kids. Josh Powell then blew the house up with him and the two kids inside. Story 15. Went through YouTube shorts the other day, and for some reason it sent me into a video of a young girl, maybe like 10 or 11, screaming and crying her head off, saying she's sorry and she thought it wasn't real. Her mother cursing at her while an officer handcuffed the kid and was calmly asking her questions, stuff like where the knife was, she had thrown it out the window, and saying he was going to sit her down in the car and so on. Turns out the mother had taken her off some meds when it shouldn't have happened and she stabbed her brother to death thinking she was in a nightmare. Her mom says stuff like, you better pray he lives and such. Why the hell it was on shorts was beyond me but it wasn't really what I wanted to hear before heading to sleep. Yikes, my YouTube time before bed is meant to help me relax and unwind after a long day. I can't imagine trying to go to bed after watching that story. I know the nightmares I'd be having would very much be real. Story 16, the Ruth Price 911 call where she's this old woman living alone in her apartment when some stranger keeps trying to get in. He eventually does, and then she can be heard screaming for her life. I think he was stabbing her. Fortunately, she survived and lived another 14 years. Pretty sure it was used to train dispatch in the past for how horrific the audio is. If I remember correctly, in reality, the killer was some guy who tried to choke her, 
but she was able to fight them off. Yes, she actually survived the encounter, despite how terrifying the audio is. Story 17. For me personally, it's the audio and video. It's a grandmother who killed her son-in-law, and for some reason, the police bring in the woman's young granddaughter, daughter of the victim. And the grandmother is insane and asks for a hug, and the little girl screams, No, you kill my daddy. I honestly have no idea why the police brought in the girl. It's horrible. That case is covered in the TV show, Signs of a Psychopath. The grandmother celebrated her birthday by murdering her son-in-law. She was chortling with laughter over her crime. Son-in-law was a good father who loved his family. The interview is bizarre, and towards the end, the wife questions mom about killing her husband. Story 18. This one is accompanied by video, but the reaction of a man whose wife gets killed when a brick flies off the back of a truck they were driving behind on a highway and came through their windshield. The audio was captured by their dash cam, one of those things you can't unhear. Yeah, this one is just straight depressing, extreme raw emotion of a sudden and violent loss of life. I can't even begin to imagine how traumatizing that is. I used to work at a hospital and I can never get the sounds of unbridled, animalistic wailing out of my head. There's no sound like the sound of somebody's heart and soul shredded to pieces when they've lost their center. I still haven't heard this video and I don't want to because I still can't get the sounds of mothers screaming for their child or a husband for his dead wife out of my head. Story 19. Probably the audio of Timothy Treadwell and his girlfriend getting eaten by bears. What the hell? I opened the abdominal cavity and released the gases and fluids that had built up during the past day and a half. Mesenteric fat was abundant. The stomach was distended and full. Contents wore exclusively human body parts and clothing. Approximately 25 pounds of muscle, adipose tissue, and skin were removed. Bone fragments were prevalent. Rib, foot, pelvis, and vertebrae fragments were identifiable, but most was too small for gross identification. Much dark blonde hair about 45 centimeters long was present, as was an esophagus and trachea. I also removed most of a white undershirt and some unidentifiable dark material. Intestines also had material in them, but it was too digested to make positive identification. Story 20. I'd imagine the tape of 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downey's rape and murder made by the Moore's murderers would be a contender. It's never been released, thankfully. Though I've seen plenty of interviews with the policemen who had to listen to the tape, and you can just see on their faces how much it affected them. I've heard about that. I could have sworn that I heard a few seconds of it from a documentary but my memory isn't great. But I do remember that it shocked me to the core if it was what I heard. There has been a partial transcript, so you might have heard a recreation of that part. But the actual tape was never released. It was locked away in some police vault, though probably it was destroyed after the trial ended. They did an exact recreation of the first few seconds from the transcript for one of the early 2000s dramas, so they could use it in a courtroom scene. That might be what you heard. This transcript is horrendous, by the way, so not safe for life. Story 21. The video that came out a few years ago in Pennsylvania, I believe. Two neighbors were arguing over snow removal or something petty. Sounds like it had been going on for some time. Neighbor shoots the female in the street, then goes inside and gets a rifle. As he approaches here lying there in the street, the audio picks up him mentioning, next time you'll keep your fucking mouth shut, and then shoots her point blank in the middle of the street. I've seen and heard a lot of nasty stuff on Reddit, but that video and audio will live with me forever as a testament of the evil humans are capable of. The old guy also kills the woman's husband, who was taunting him alongside her moments earlier. Then he goes into his house and kills himself, though this part is obviously not captured on the doorbell video. Story 22. The 911 call of the woman whose chimp was eating her friend's face. Travis the monkey my girlfriend is obsessed with the story and is actually nuts. He was often given Xanax in his morning tea to help calm him as he was naturally very agitated towards anyone who wasn't his owner. And on the day of the incident, he saw his owner's friend remove her glasses and put her hair up and that triggered him to go into a drug-fused rage where he didn't register pain or respond to his owner for a pretty big chunk of time due to the Xanax. He degloved the victim as well as tore off her nose and ears and parts of her cheeks. Fucking terrible. All while his owner stabbed and beat him repeatedly. On top of being stabbed multiple times, he was also shot up to 15 times during the actual incident by cops and did not die until hours after the drugs from his tea wore off. 
Initially, officers thought that the 911 call was a prank call too, so they hesitated on dispatching officers until other neighbors called as well. It still baffles me that to this day, many are unaware of the danger that chimps can pose. They are strong, and when triggered, there's not much that an average person like you or me can do to overpower and stop them. They're friendly, yes, but incidents like this have proven that their triggers can be very random, but the consequences can be dire. Story 23. The voicemail my stepfather left my mom the morning of 9-11. He worked on the 99th floor and called to tell us that he was okay and was making his way down the stairs. He said he would call us again when he was outside. He never did. In the call, you can hear him telling others to keep their heads down out of the smoke. But what really makes the audio as disturbing as it is, is the screaming. The screams in the background are some of the most bone-chillingly real terror I think I've ever heard. Story 24. The woman who helped build the case against Jared from Subway by recording him talking about his enjoyment of pedophilia. Listening to a couple of minutes of him describing what he's done made me want to vomit. The process of getting this stuff on tape wrecked the woman's mental health, and it's easy to see why. That documentary was tough to get through. That woman proves how unstoppable a mom protecting children can be. Absolutely disgusting things. And she pushed through to help get the arrest made. True hero. Story 25. Since other people are mentioning videos with horrible audio, that one of the nightclubs burning down. The sounds of people screaming trying to get out of the crush and then burning to death is just awful. The worst parts are, one, at one point someone on fire is seen running out, and two, how the screaming suddenly stops and it gets eerily quiet. No, the worst part is when the guy with the camera runs to the other side of the nightclub and you can hear people clawing at the wall as the windows were too high up and they're burning alive. You can hear one woman there scream, I'm on fire, at 538. And then when the cameraman runs to a back exit where the black smoke is billowing out, he yells to see if anyone's there, and a very faint moan is heard, at 504. That reminds me of a testimony given by one of the survivors of the Titanic. They said that the worst sound they ever heard was all the people in the ocean screaming in pain because of how cold the water was. Then they paused and said that, actually, that wasn't the worst sound they heard. What was worse than that was the silence a few minutes later. Story 26, the one where these two teens go into the guy's basement and without them knowing, he's waiting down there with his gun and shoots both of them and can hear the guy say something right before he shoots the girl as she's trying to go back up the stairs. I can't remember all what happened, but that was pretty chilling. Maybe someone here knows what I'm talking about. I remember that. Apparently, the boyfriend had been breaking into this guy's house for a while. Homeowner contacted the police, told them he suspected this young man, and they said that there was nothing they could do. Homeowner decides to lay in wait for the home intruder and kill him when he enters. Girlfriend comes in shortly after the first shot and is also killed. Homeowner waited 24 hours, I think, may have been 48, to inform police that he had killed two people because he didn't want to bother them on Thanksgiving. Edit, they were cousins, not dating. The wiki says he notified the police of one break-in and waited until the next day to call about the murders, keeping the bodies in his closet. Story 27. There was a teenage boy who drove a minivan. He somehow became wedged in one of the folding chairs but was able to call for help as he slowly suffocated to death. He said something along the lines of, I can barely breathe. I think I'm gonna die here. It's heart-wrenching to know that audio exists and no one was able to find him in time. The minivan was in his school parking lot overnight. Edit to add, his name was Kyle Plush. This happened in 2018. He was 16 years old. Someone mentioned Plush and the 911 operator had a hard time understanding one another. However, in the audio, it's clear what he said for the most part. Cincinnati PD was sued, and they updated their systems because he would have been saved had the 911 operator relayed the information she was given to the officers who were on site while Plush spoke with her. His quote was actually, I probably don't have much time left, so tell my mom I love her if I die. His body was found six hours later by his father at 9 p.m. Story 28. This is a minor one, but it messed with me. It was a UFO documentary on TV in about 1995. There's a bit where the woman being abducted puts out a tape recorder in her room all night and captures a male voice saying, don't wake up. So that in itself was really scary. But all I could think of was that this was a rape about to happen and the poor woman was using UFO stuff as a cover to protect her sanity. And that just rocked me. 
And if someone in law enforcement heard it, wouldn't they feel the same? The whole thing was just hard to process. Story 29. The audio of the huge dairy farm that caught fire in Texas is fucking haunting. 18,000 cows crammed into a warehouse and burning alive. I once had to disconnect the electrical supply of a large farm shed that had collapsed due to snow. The shed had been filled with 150 plus sheep. People laugh when I tell them about it, but it was fucking horrible hearing them in pain. What kind of psychopath laughs at that sort of thing? Story 30. There is a phone call tape in the fog of war where President Johnson tells Robert McNamara that he kept his mouth shut as Kennedy tried to de-escalate the Vietnam conflict, and now that he's president, he wanted McNamara to build a plan to reverse that strategy and get results. As that decision led to my father fighting there and coming back as a man changed for the worse, I'll say that was my most disturbing audio. Story 31 the cult leader from the documentary Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey, where he records his rape of a young girl in his secret room in which only the most devout followers are allowed. It's haunting. Well, I'm taking this out of my Netflix queue. I want to clarify, they do not play the whole thing. They only play a piece leading up to the rape. You do not have to hear that. But what they do play is still sickening. To be honest, I feel bad for the jury in the trial. They did have to hear the whole thing and apparently many of them started crying. Story 32. For me, it was the hospital Santa actor crying and explaining that some of the children on death's door were more worried about missing Christmas than they were about dying. Years later, I still cry when I think about it. If you can watch this entire video without shedding a tear, I'd be extremely surprised. To me, this tops the Jonestown tape or even videos of people getting tortured that I unfortunately watched as a kid. There is some terrible shit on the internet, but nothing hits me as hard as children worrying more about Christmas than dying. The pure innocence of literally letting go of life in Santa's arms after learning you didn't miss Christmas, I cried even typing this. Story 33. There's audio of an astronaut burning up in the atmosphere. I don't recall if it was an American mission or a Russian one. Russian. Thing is, he knew he was going to die before the launch, but Yuri Gagarin was his best friend and would have taken his place if he refused to go. So he's cursing out all the people who put him there as he's burning up in the atmosphere. The picture of all the generals at his funeral looking over just a pile of charred remains is very eerie as well. Story 34. Jim Jones talking into a microphone while his followers poisoned their children. This was the one that came to mind for me, forcing those kids to take poison. They had many of the children poisoned before the mothers, so the mothers would be more willing to drink. Truly sickening. I also remember hearing that he had people physically restrain his wife because he knew she would try to save the children while they were getting poisoned. By the time most of the children were dead, she was let go and she voluntarily drank the Kool-Aid. Story 35. Warren Jeffs of the Fundamentalist Church of Latter-day Saints tape recorded himself raping a 12-year-old. The most disturbing audio I've heard. I grew up in the Apostolic United Brethren, which is a polygamous offshoot sect of the FLDS. My last name is all over that documentary, and it took me a week to watch. They alluded to this in the doc, but Warren was a meticulous note-taker. Whether it be from paranoia, mental health, religious pride, or a combination of all three plus some, he recorded everything. That clip is one of hundreds. Hell is too forgiving a place for Warren, and I hope the prison guards crush Nature Valley bars and his bed sheets before he goes to bed. Story 36. Recording of Warren Jeffs, leader of the FLDS. During a ceremony with some of his many wives, including sex with a newly married 12-year-old bride. Prophet's Prey documentary goes into the whole FLDS cult and is very disturbing. Under the Banner of Heaven on Hulu, based on the book by John Krakauer, goes into the FLDS a lot. Also, Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey on Netflix. Story 37. One I haven't seen mentioned, I remember videos of phones ringing like crazy around victims after the Pulse nightclub shooting and the Vegas shooting. That also reminds me of the haunting 9-11 footage where you can hear a ton of beeping coming out of the wreckage. The beeping sounds were coming from the bodies of firefighters trapped in the collapsed standard kit to find stuck or incapacitated firefighters. Story 38. For me, it's Alessandro Moreschi, the last Castrato singing Ave Maria. For those who don't know, Castrato was a type of voice only belonging to children who were castrated before puberty. The parents of the children usually did this to preserve the children's high voices so they can keep singing and make them money. There's an audio of Alessandro singing Ave Maria on YouTube. 
The voice is very eerie because the voice came from a man who's also a boy and he was also around his 40s or 50s when it was recorded. The comment that I saw under the video that stuck with me said something like, his voice is in between a child and a woman's voice. If you thought pageant moms were bad, I think this practice takes the cake on one of the most effed up things parents exploiting their children for money have done. Story 39. Apparently, there's a sickening audio tape of Myra Hindley and Ian Brady, the Moore's murderers, of them assaulting a child that is not allowed to the public. They were absolutely disgusting, and the poor child just cried for her mother and didn't understand what they were doing to her. They would use Myra to lure children in, and Ian would do what he wanted to them. This tape is supposedly used for training new officers. Story 40. The mom screams her heart out when she walks in on her son, who just blasted his face off with a shotgun. It's from the 4chan kids suicide video years ago. Yeah, the gore was pretty intense, but it was so quick you don't really process it. Then his mom comes home with his little sisters and it's the worst piece of audio I have heard. Fucked me up for a good while and got me to stop being so morbidly curious because there are some things we just shouldn't see or hear willingly. Story 41. Owen Hart was a WWE wrestler who died during an entrance on a live pay-per-view. His harness came down to the ring and snapped. There is one clip of it that exists in any public form, and it's an audio recording from the Spanish announcer table where you can hear nothing but a sickening, crunchy thump as he hits the ring. Supposedly, the original video recording of the incident is locked deep away, with instructions to never watch or open printed on it. Story 42. Not disturbing to me, but to most people. Radio traffic between the crashing airliner and the tower. Pilots were pros all the way down, no screaming, no panic, just doing everything they could to save people. When it was obvious they were going to crash, they aimed for a spot where most of the passengers would live. But the cockpit was going to be destroyed. Last words from the pilot was something like, Roger that, thank you for your assistance. Sorry, but it's been a few decades, so I can't remember more details. Story 43, the weepy voiced killer. He killed women, completely mutilated them, and proceeded to call the police while crying about what happened and how he can't stop himself. Then he'd hang up and do it again. Jeez, talk about not holding yourself accountable. Story 44, the badge came with audio of the Daniel Shaver shooting. He was on his knees trying to comply while the officers were shouting contradictory commands at him before they shot him while he's on the floor of the hotel hallway. Story 45, Army of Aztec Death Whistles. If you watch a search on YouTube of one blowing one, it's in the shape of a skull pretty much always and sounds terrifying. Imagine you're some Spanish conquistador hearing an army that sounds like that getting louder, getting closer, coming to kill you. Story 46, not really a tape, but the video of the 2023 shark attack in Egypt. Hearing the guy being eaten alive while screaming dad was terrifying. Ugh, I made the mistake of watching that. When he yelled Papa, it just broke me. Do not, I repeat, do not watch this. You will never forget it. Story 47, the 999 call from an elderly woman who had just been robbed. She had a heart attack from the stress and died while on the phone to the operator. The operator was crying and you could just hear her sadly say, Oh Maureen, when the line went quiet as she died. Story 48, the guy whose scuba kit fucked up and he sunk a few hundred feet and couldn't rise again. And you could just hear the muffled screaming noises under his mask. Edit, he died while on the bottom of the sea, and his kid was recovered with the audio and body a while after. Story 49, a 911 call of a little girl who had just found her brother in his room after he committed suicide. The most heartbreaking part is when she screams, why did you do it? Please leave your stories in the comments. I'd love to make a video of them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.